At a time when we are revisiting valuations, staring down the barrel of stagflation or worse, all companies, big and small, need to run properly and start reporting profits. So what can small and large businesses learn from each other? Well, my guest works with major names at both ends of the spectrum. Mike Rhodes, CEO and founder of Consult My Apps. First of all, Mike, welcome to the show and really jealous because you have an awesome building with a skyline we can just about see in London. So tell me a little bit about Consult My App. Yeah, no, thank you very much, Peggy, for the warm welcome. Uh, yes, we do have a beautiful view. Uh, if you can believe me, I promise you this isn't just drawn onto the, the window behind me, but we're in the uh, the 29th floor of the Gherkin in central London, so it's uh, not a great day today, but hey, it's uh, it's better than rain, so, you know, as, as us Brits love talking about the weather, no no better place to start, I guess. Uh, I guess, actually, I'll, I'll start with myself and a bit of background on, on me and how I got to CMA. So, uh, I am a computer science grad, so going back many, many years, more than I care to remember. Uh, so I graduated with a first in computer science, so I've always been into technology, data, things like that. Uh, I sort of cut my teeth in uh, in that sector, really working at companies like Experian and SAS, the analytics business. So I spent a lot of time in North Carolina out there in the research triangle, um, really heading up consultancy teams. Now, historically, that was looking at anti-money laundering, counter-terrorist financing, you know, so counter-fraud, which is very interesting. Um, but the market itself was all retail banks, capital markets, big institutions, and it was quite quite slow at adopting new and innovate, uh, innovative uh, technologies and approaches. Um, so fast forward a little bit, then I, I about uh, 10 years ago now, I moved into mobile, working for a couple of uh, uh, mobile software vendors uh, that produce sort of uh, customer engagement uh, platforms such as Swerve, other levels, I really started to get a real passion for the mobile industry because you've got to bear in mind that when I graduated, mobile apps were really only just starting to emerge as a thing at all, uh, let alone there be marketing companies around it. And in my time at those two businesses, I realized, you know, the market has a big thirst for knowledge and experience and education in the space of mobile and and how to you know how to make apps work but how to engage your customers how to retain them how to convert them into monetized users and uh, and ultimately all the technology that fits around that and there was a real realization as well that marketing doesn't exist just on its own anymore the product realm has come into it and it is uh it's a space that it really excites me because it's you know the areas of marketing which i love and analytics and data with technology after doing sort of uh, about five six years working for other companies i decided to set consult my app or CMA, as I will hear, hear on refer to it, uh, up to, to basically provide consultancy services. And it, it initially it was, well, just myself. I had enough money for, you know, a couple of months rent, I think, just about. Um, and uh, I started sort of work with, uh, you know, our first client that was Sega, just building out some, you know, basic messaging strategies around their, their Sega Forever brand, which was really interesting and very exciting as a first client. Um, and, and sort of throughout the years, then we've, we've sort of grown to the, 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 the company we are now. Uh, so we're about 50 odd consultants, obviously based in uh, central London with uh, an office in Germany as well. Um, and we, we work across the entire spectrum of mobile marketing, uh, you know, really in, in two ways. One is managed services, so app store optimization, paid media acquisition, CRM engagement, data analytics, BI, all of the this creative design, all the things you'd expect. And also a, a side of the business, which is consulting. So it's very much McKinsey style consulting, which is, you know, we're taking, we're talking with big companies and we're trying to address their, their business objectives and, and challenges with solutions that, you know, cut across all of those, those areas. And uh, we, we probably talk about that as a strategy move uh, as we get through the, through the podcast. But yeah, that's where we are. Um, and we, we work with, like you said, lots of different clients from General Motors, uh, sort of the big organizations, uh, Trainline, you know, Pure Gym, O2, who got a shout out at Apple's, uh, uh, Apple's uh, launch uh, announcement yesterday when they mm -hmm. were talking about their, their new satellite uh, technology. So yeah, we have a really wide vary right through to those superstar startups like Tide Banking. So uh, yeah, a very varied and interesting job. That's what it is. It is this spectrum that I found intriguing at first because it's small business, large business. We're going to talk about those lessons in a moment, but also you are looking at complete business transformation. It's not just about providing clients with a one point approach or solution. Yes, you do do ASO 
and you do do optimization, but you do them together and you're trying to show that interconnectedness. I mean, what was the industry doing before or how has this changed? Because this wasn't what we needed before, but it's what we're looking to need now. <laughs> uh, really interesting. There's so many factors at play. I mean, you know, it's never a quiet, quiet day in politics and economics these days. But, um, you know, if we go back, let's say five years, the industry cared about acquisition, growth, MAU, just getting large numbers of people through the door, if they can keep them great. And in general, if we push enough people into the leaky bucket, the leaky bucket maintains a full status, but you're hemorrhaging money down, down the side. That was an approach that was taken. And because money was easier to come by back then, you know, you were getting companies valued and getting funding VC backing for hundreds of millions of dollars that were, were little more than an idea, but they were just able to, because there was the potential to, to make a lot of cash. Uh, and really back then it was all about acquisition and driving people through the door. Nobody considered what happened afterwards because they had enough money to keep, you know, keep the rate of flow on that, uh, that pipe at such a level that it, it didn't matter how many holes you had in your bucket. It was always full. Sadly, the, the holes has decreased now. And, and what we're starting to see is a, a realization. We can't just keep throwing crazy sums of money into these apps. And, uh, what we need to consider is actually. How do we nurture and retain, engage, and, and convert the users we've got in there? The, really, the, the focus has shifted a little away from it being top of the funnel, let's just get as many as we can into, hey, look, we can spend less money there, but get the same results by focusing post-acquisition. In terms of looking at our data and analytics, uh, looking at our customer engagement CRM, you know, re reviewing you know, how do these creatives perform both at the top of the funnel and also further down in terms of uh, comms on when onboarding users. So, you know, all of this has really, really changed in the last, uh, I would say the last few years. And I, I do remember actually the last time we met was a, an app promotion summit quite a few years ago. And, uh, you know, there they were, uh, uh, they, uh, there were a panel of people on the stage and I put the question to them, if you had a million dollars today, what would you spend it on? Would you spend it on uh, acquisition or would you spend it on retaining the users? And, you know, unanimously, they all said, we put it in acquisition. Uh, <laughs> obviously, it was not the answer I wanted to hear, but you know, it shows that, that times are, are massively changing now. Babe. And another thing I'm hearing, and I just wanted to see, because you have your finger on the pulse, Mike, I want to understand, you know, just in a sense, I won't say how bad is it, but how different is it? For example, I've been talking to marketers and they're saying, you know, between just the pure economics of the app industry and the app economy, and also, you know, user level data, right? IDFA, all those, all those nightmares and concepts that marketers have had to deal with, you know, CPMs are up 10 X, you know, budgets are very, very different. What are some of the numbers? What are some of the trends you're seeing that give me an idea of just how marketers have to do more with less? How less is it? Yeah. So, well, how less, I mean, you're talking about decreases in budget anywhere from sort of 30 down up to, we've seen actually more recently, sort of 70% cuts in budget. Mm -hmm. It refocuses the mind uh, when, when you don't have such big pockets. Um, and of course, not all of our clients are, you know, the size of GM or O2, you know, the, 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 the sort of the guys that have less, less funding, um, you know, it really does focus the minds when time times hard. And, you know, it, it, as much as yes, you've got to think about what happens post acquisition. You've also got to think about what are you doing at the top of the funnel in terms of which channels are you using? And, you know, since the removal of IDFA, it's made things so much more difficult in a lot of the social channels. And what we've seen is a big migration of money into things like Apple search ads, because Apple knew exactly what they were doing when they removed that. And they said, well, look, if you really want to target properly and have any chance of measuring the attribution on it, you're probably gonna to have to use our ASA platform on iOS. Um, so we're seeing a lot of more money going into that. What we're also seeing is that I think a net result of that is people are getting more sophisticated with the way in which they, 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 they look at those numbers that, you know, cost per install is a metric that is largely dead in the, what the, the CPI is an irrelevant term. As far as we're concerned as a business, you're looking at cost per acquisition because, you know, I can get you the cheapest traffic in the world at, you know, five cents an install. I guarantee it's not going to convert very well into actual customers or paying users. So you now the CPI and that that world of volume is is dying. People are looking at what happens once they've installed. Actually, what do they go on to do? And they're connecting the dots between that install funnel and then the post acquisition, 
you know, the, the, the way they treat those users. And that might be simple stuff like uh, impacting the, you know, the onboarding flow uh, and altering the messaging they see depending on which channel they've come from. Um, or it might be, you know, looking, reviewing simple stuff like keywords, like which keywords are converting well? Like, does it matter if this keyword is, you know, $20 an install when I get a 100% conversion rate off the back of it versus this keyword that's, you know, 50 cents, but my conversion rate's about 0.001%. Um, so, you know, people are getting a lot more sophisticated and they're addressing that through, you know, through looking at their MarTech stack because this requires new technology and it's not just, you know, it's just not just sort of an MMP now. You need to connect your MMP to a CDP, to your analytics. So, so lots of acronyms, but, you know, there's lots of bits uh, of pieces in this jigsaw which are being filled in, uh, I think, from a technology point of view, allowing people to, you know, I guess, embrace some of these uh, more sophisticated ways of viewing uh, acquisition with a reduced budget. It is a bigger picture view. And it reminds me of something you said in prep that stayed with me. It's like almost um, something for a t-shirt, Mike. You know, you said big businesses are missing tech, small businesses are missing process. What did you mean by that? Yeah, that's a good point. I, yeah, it, by the way, if anyone does make a niche on this, do ask for some small royalties. <laughs> like I say, it's all yours now. You take it. You run with it. You write your blogs. You do your book. But seriously. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So, yeah, what I meant by that is it's small businesses. You know, I'm talking about, you know, the new startups. You know, they, and this is not a startup that's been going for a week. I'm talking about a startup that's been around, let's say, six, 12 months. So they, they have an idea that actually does work and generate some money. They're starting from scratch. They start with zero technology. So they have a great advantage over big business in that they can pick and choose whatever they like. They don't, they're not stuck with an incumbent SAP, God help them, or, or Salesforce um, to, to, you know, run the CRM and messaging for their mobile app. They can go and pick a Braze or an Iterable or a Bloomreach and, uh, uh, and then put a, a nice analytics solution, which has been built for products like a mix panel in there. And, you know, these, th these are choices they are afforded and gifted because they start from nothing and are able to pick best of breed for their, um, for their particular, uh, particular app and industry. Um, now, the problem that they do have is they haven't been instilled. A lot of these startups don't necessarily come from people that have worked in, you know, corporate world and probably an exception to come from you know corporate world into the, the cool mobile uh, sort of startup world but most people that are from startups are crazily intelligent enthusiastic and passionate but they they've probably done that after not very many years post university if any years or post college and you know for that reason they haven't had the the experience of working and, and knowing the value of processes um, and by that i mean you know how do you uh, how do you go about evaluating new software or how do you go about um, deciding technologies to embrace within your, uh, within your product? Or, you know, who do you go and speak to if you've got a challenge uh, with a legal issue or should you just go and put this in that message in here? Is that compliant with, what the, you know, with the, the, the rules and regulations at the time, all of these things can easily get overlooked. And before long, you, you know, somebody makes a decision without thinking about it. So there's no approval process or governance around it. And suddenly data gets leaked or uh, something else happens and there's a security issue or somebody puts a message in a push notification which you know breaches all sorts of and suddenly the company is in a load of trouble the the beauty of a large organization which is why it's a lot slower these you know checks and balances are in place and you know those processes are largely there and they have lots of different teams to do that and they've had the advantage of time the disadvantage is over that time, they've accumulated a lot of legacy technology. So that's sort of what, what my thoughts are. So, you, you know, the, the perfect scenario is somewhere in between, I think. You do have a maturity model that you use at CMA. Tell us about the model and perhaps give us an idea of what a potential client needs to ask themselves in order to get the most out of it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and this is showing my age. I remember the days when maturity models, IBM used to throw them out left, right, and center for data governance and creating single customer views. There are all sorts of maturity models. It's a there. data maturity um, model now, by the way. I'm on the board of the oh, yeah. Marketing Association. We have one of those. But they're, oh, they serve a purpose. Tell me about yours. They do. They absolutely do. And so, you know, we always talk about, well, CMA is as much a consultancy as, a, as an agency. And, and we, you know, we don't just say that we, we do do stand by it and, and work in that way. And one of the ways in which we do that and help our clients, you know, really evolve the maturity of their mobile marketing setup, whether they are, 
you know, the, the super advanced, you know, king dot coms of the world, uh, or they are the, you know, people just wetting their, you know, wetting their feet in the, the area of mobiles, some of the more established businesses that haven't necessarily focused on it initially. Um, we have a number of maturity models. So there isn't just a singular, this is mobile marketing, here's what you do. Um, it looks at mobile from a, a number of different aspects. So the first of which is, you know, the MarTech stack itself. So there is a, a level of maturity attached to that, and depending on which pieces you've got, of course, not everything is relevant to every uh, every company. Right through to, you know, the, the CRM, uh, maturity models and the analytics and data maturity models through to creative and UX. And all of these maturity models have a fundamental part to play in us working with our clients, understanding their challenges and taking them on a journey to get them to where they get to. And that is seldom, if ever, a single solution, just UA is the answer, or just ASO is the answer, or just do these creatives differently. It's usually collective. Um, so what we do is we use the maturity models. They have anywhere from about 50 to 80 different areas in, uh, in them. So for instance, in the, uh, the, the CRM on the customer engagement wheel, we might be looking at, is your uh, CRM platform tied up to your customer engagement solution? Uh, do you use app inboxes? Um, you know, there, there are lots of things in there, but, but some of those, those metrics, we score our clients from a one to five with five being you are will beating best of breed. One being it's not really been looked at at all or even considered. So it's not even a thought at this stage. Um, and what that allows us to do is produce a nice scorecard and we sort of visualize it uh, in, a, in a wonderful way. So you can see, you know, where the client starts at the engagement and fast forward, you know, we can see how those, that maturity improves and how those scores improve over the months and ultimately years we're working with our clients. And it's a great yardstick to measure our performance. You know, if we put aside, you know, the core metrics such as, you know, revenue and, you know, additional uplifts in install or increases in retention or conversion rate improvements, and we start looking at, you know, actually the, the underlying reasons for that, that is the maturity. And it's a great way of measuring how you as a business have improved over that time uh, in those areas. And also equally importantly, identifying the areas that are still to be improved that we need to work on. Uh, and we, we sort of address each one of those as we go through, through our engagements with our clients. So it really is a fundamental to our, you know, certainly our strategic engagements with our, our large, larger clients. And we, we actually have, um, apologies for, for rattling on a little, but, but we also have uh, one of our clients even took our maturity model and took it internally. Mm -hmm. They now use it uh, as part of their own governance and, uh, and measurement. So their whole management team is bought into this uh, and improving their uh, improving their position on against that maturity. I was going to ask about that because that is Trainline that's done that. They've done it. They've taken it internally, which tells it that the, that the questions are as important as the examination, as the whole process. Tell me about those questions. I mean, there's a ton of them. We can't go through all of them, but what are the ones or one that you're asking it and your clients are like, you haven't been asked that before, but now that you make me think about it, you know, oh my, we have to address it or fix it or put someone on it. Um, explore some of those questions with me. Absolutely. So I'm, I'm just sort of racking my brain thinking of the common ones. I mean, so the, the interesting ones and the real big ones are, are things, uh, app inbox I touched on before. Like when mm -hmm. we look at, so one of the things we like, like to do is, like, you know, first of all, establish well, which channels are you actually using in your mix at the moment? And if you're stuck with something like a Salesforce, it's probably going to be email, SMS, push-ish, uh, and maybe some in-app stuff, but you're certainly not going to go much beyond that into the realm of, you know, enhanced push or, or sort of app inboxes. So an app inbox is a great one because, you know, it's got 100% reach across all your audience, yet not many people actually use it. Certainly a minority channel uh, because people don't generally understand it or know what it is or why they would want to use it. That, that is a, a common thing. I think the other piece as well is looking at how the systems and data integrate because a lot of people go out and buy a Braze and think, oh, I could just use Braze in isolation. And you can, uh, by the way, Braze is just an example, obviously, you know, it's full bloom reaches the you know, clever taps. There are many, many, many others out there, um, but they can't use them to their, 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 I guess, an optimal level without considering how do they communicate with the other channels because, or with the other data sources. So I would always say your MMP needs to feed data into that because we talked about it earlier. Actually, how do you uh, adapt your onboarding process 
based on the channels that the users come from. Because, you know, someone acquired from TikTok, probably going to be different someone acquired from Facebook in terms of demographic. You should ultimately adapt your onboarding flow. If you're not feeding that data into those platforms, you know, you're already at a disadvantage. You'll never get the optimum conversion rate for your, your product. Um, so that, that's, that's a really good example. And of course, where you've got big analytics platforms or CDPs, you know, feeding that segmentation data back into those platforms make it, makes a big, big difference. So definitely say the big questions that we tend to get usually lower scores on are data integration across the MarTech stack um, and, and certainly message channels that are either underutilized or not at all. And of course, how do you communicate between the channels? Because, you know, sometimes you'll find people have email and push and SMS and they just blast all three channels simultaneously. So the fact that you're using the channel doesn't necessarily mean you're using it well. So those questions go uh, a sort of level beneath that in terms of seeing how to cross channel communication strategy working. And the, the final bit I would say is a common area above those two is, you know, how does it, how does your strategy and your, your marketing strategy go between uh, desktop web, mobile web, app, um, in terms of channel of comms, but also in terms of that user experience, because often it, it is overlooked and a web user is treated differently to an app user. Even in some businesses, they're totally different divisions, would you believe? So, you know, making sure that that is, is, is really treated as one is, is really important. Uh, and of course, that also goes to, you know, how often do your marketing and product teams and tech teams catch up because if it's not at least once every couple of weeks, that is a problem because you're not building stuff like app inboxes, like, um, you know, action buttons in push, you know, generally to make it useful, it requires products and depth. Mm -hmm. um, so you can't just as a marketer decide, oh, I'm going to put app inbox in and use that, you know, populating that with lots of content. I need to bring in the dev team. So, you know, a lot of what, a lot of the, the sort of things that we look at in there, probably I'd say they're the three big ones that are the, the, the ones that need most focus. And that's great that you're sharing that because that tells us also, you know, where marketers need to focus. Really interesting point on the app inbox as well. You know, the channels, the approaches that marketers are not getting the most mileage out of. Another point you make in the maturity model is that interplay between organic and paid channels. They're coming together. CRM is increasingly part of that mix as well. I'm not hearing it just from you, from a lot of people, you know, organic and paid come together. Maybe you want to unpack that a little bit and help us with some advice about how they hum come together or how you can get the most out of them, because there has to be a fit. If you tell me you have the best acquisition setup in the world and I say, cool, how does that work? Oh, well, we're combining acquisition and paid. I will tell you that is not the best acquisition setup because you didn't mention CRM post acquisition stuff. Mm. There's no way you can refine that those acquisition channels without considering that link back into it as a feedback loop. However, we consider just paid and organic for a starter for, for 10. Um, you know, they are intrinsically linked. You cannot and should not ever separate the two. You should have but an acquisition team. We have all team. these years, Mike. We have been doing exactly that. Well, I, I, I would bet I do know of some companies that treat ASO differently to paid and have, you know, they, uh, uh, they, they certainly have two different outlooks on it and that combined acquisition view. So, because if you look at things, you have performance marketing managers, they just care about paid and you have organic marketing and they just care about ASO. Um, the, the reason you want to combine the two is because ASO will drive performance in paid because ASO isn't just about keywords and tweaking with rankings and getting your app featured. It's also about conversion rate because even if you're running TV ads, anything above the line, out home, you know, paid me, it doesn't matter. Everything hits those store listings. So if you haven't optimized that for conversion rates, you're probably wasting money because your CPAs will be way higher than they should be on those channels. So that's number one tip, uh, mm. I would say, consider that. The, the second is, you know, cannibalization. Everyone talks about this, but what does it mean? You know, we worked with a, a big client recently that were working with another agency who I think, under, fair to say, understood old school marketings, out of home, to an extent web, didn't get app. Uh, and they were running Apple search ads campaigns. And, you know, we proved that they were, by switching off their brand campaigns, that actually the organics picked it up. So they were wasting something like, uh, half a million to a million dollars a year bidding on terms that their organics would pick up anyway. And that's, 
awful to see that. Um, but it's obviously great for us because we can demonstrate that's a problem. You shouldn't be doing that. So, you know, these are a couple of examples of, you know, where paid and organic really have an interplay uh, and they depend on each other. And, you know, there's lots of other areas I could talk about. So obviously paid, if you increase your acquisition volume velocity over a certain window, you'll go higher up the rankings mm. and then that will generate organic lifts and, you know, other bits and pieces. But ultimately there is a lot to a lot to be said in the two main areas of the two i've just just talked about that and that's why some people are even saying now that there's going to be like an aso person for every part of marketing or maybe even a chief aso officer i mean you're probably booked solid mike you don't want to take on that position perhaps but what do you see about the position of aso you know in the marketing department because it has been very separate up to this point but you're saying hey everything is coming together it's all part of the mix it has to come together as well absolutely i mean aso it, if I, a lot of people that don't get aso or you know if you look at some agencies out there you hit you see aso and immediately it says keyword rankings yep. And you know, that's a that's a vanity metric. Who cares? I don't care if I'm number one. I care about what happens further down the funnel and how much money that generates for me. But if I can achieve that be by being number one for 50 other terms rather than waste all my money on one particular term and get more money out of it, I'll do that. Um, but it's not just about keyword rankings, it's about it's about improving traffic from browse. So actually, how do you link with other apps and uh, uh, and how do you then generate higher conversion rates from the traffic that's landing on the site? And of course, you've got uh, now new tools on uh, on the App Store that we've had on Google Play for ages that allow us to do some of that that sort of testing on on the creative. So, um, it absolutely is a big, big job and a function in its own right. It's not just about trying different keywords in a key in the keyword and title, subtitle, short. That is a vast underestimation. These days, you've got to be a great copywriter to provide, you know, feature submissions, which Apple are going to pick up on. You've got to be able to, you know, uh, generate uh, awesome in-app event material to not just yield the keyword rank improvements, but also to, to, to get more, you know, drag traffic from, from that, that search portfolio, which, you know, your in-app events can rank above your organic listing. So there's, there's so many things these days. I mean, if we look at, our agency as a whole, the effort that we put into ASO today versus the number of hours we put into an account five years ago is probably six or seven fold because of all the new features, <laughs> all the new you know technology we're able to use in the app yeah. store that allows us to do testing we didn't before. That it is such a big job that you can't just have. I mean, gone are the days where one a company that operates globally has one ASO or two ASO managers. You either need an agency or a team of five dedicated minimum ASO managers for your top probably two or three territories. It's, you know, and it's getting harder and harder because, you know, as the market matures in this space, everybody starts to do ASO. The day is like five years ago, if you did a bit of tweaking of keywords, you might be able to, you know, hack your way uh, to the top of the uh, top of the rankings for a particular keyword. But those, those days are going because the market's matured. Black hat routes have been shut down left, right, and center by Apple and Google. And you know, now it's just genuinely a lot of work, but a lot of data analysis and intelligence that we've obviously spent years building a stack to uh, to do that and, and empower our customers. And glad to say we're generally outperforming the market. So we're, we're in the right direction. I have to come back to you for some of those tips. I was going to ask you for just one because we do have to bring it to a close. And I just want a couple rapid fire question and answer, because you've got me intrigued, Mike, you know, you're talking about, you can't just tweak the keywords, but there must be something or just even just a hint of how I can get more value out of my ASO, something I can target, something I'm not thinking about. Because for example, when I think about the app inbox, you know, that's something I wasn't thinking about maybe in the tech stack or my capabilities. What about ASO? Any low hanging fruit? Yeah, there definitely is. And, and there are still surprisingly a large number of companies out there that are not embracing in-app events. Mm. Um, but, you know, I, I give something away here for the people listening, okay. but in-app events, you, do you know, actually index the content of the uh, keywords in there? That was, that was actually discovered, I'm certain, by our team first, definitely in the US sports market, because we launched an app with a number of in-app events. We started indexing. And would you believe soon after, uh, the likes of, you know, William Hill and, own and stuff started doing the same thing 
but it just so happened to be about two weeks after we launched that. So I'm pretty certain we, we uncovered that little gem first. It's starting to get fed enough. Yeah. But in-app events are not just about getting yourself there in the in the market. They're also great for indexing. And if you know the right tips and tricks, you can actually get an almost infinite keyword, uh, keyword reach, not just the 100 characters in your subtitle. So that's number one. Second is custom product pages. Um, the number of people that still aren't using custom product pages uh, is, is unbelievable. But, you know, you tie them in with your paid media. Uh, you know, again, another example of organic because CPPs might be seen as owned by ASO, but they impact largely the uh, the paid media side. You know, get custom product pages in. De I mean, if you've got an internal creative resource to do it, great. If you don't, use an agency. But, you know, the other you'll get in terms of the reduction in CPA on, on your paid channels is it's more than going to pay for the, the time and expense of creating those CPPs. So custom product pages, in-app events, two tips, I'd say, that are massively underused. Going to wrap it up with something about mobile marketing today. What upsets you the least about the state of mobile marketing today? Uh, oh, that's a real good question. You put me on the spot. I didn't prep for this. <laughs> what upsets me the least? I would say... It's the maturity. I can see light at the end of the tunnel. What used to frustrate me the most was the fact that I, you know, I was talking to people who just didn't get a lot of the stuff. And a lot of what I did was education and it slows down everything. Now the mature market is maturing, not just in terms of its knowledge and experience, but also in terms of their attitude to stuff. The wild west of ASO and UA, you know, where you've got dodgy ad networks and people black hatting left, right, and center. And you've still got some people buying keywords and manipulating their apps to the top of the store. I wouldn't suggest doing that, by the way, because mm -hmm. Apple will stop it. Uh, but, you know, those uh, you know those days are, are starting to go. But they're not out of the way yet, but they're moving. And I can see brightness, which is unlike what I can see out the window of our office because it's raining here. Uh, but I can see the brightness at the end of the tunnel. So that's what I'm excited about. And that's what makes me least angry at the moment, I think, is the fact that I can see things are getting good. I couldn't hope to end it better. Now it's contagious. I'm feeling positive about it as well. Mike, I want to thank you so much for being a guest, for sharing, and also those tips at the end. That is, That really shows that you care. You've given us a few things for free. That's awesome. Absolutely. No, my pleasure, Peggy, and I hope uh, everyone listening enjoyed it. Absolutely. And they will want to catch up with you. You've got a ton of stuff over at the website. We'll put that in the show notes, but just overall, what's the best way to stay up to date on what CMA is sharing? You know, the tips, the tricks, the tools, what's the best way? Yeah, so we have a newsletter on our website. So you go to consultmyapp.com or mm -hmm. search for consult my app. Thankfully, it's a unique name. So great from an SEO perspective, another little tip. Uh, but uh, yeah, you go to consultmyapp.com, sign up for our newsletter. Uh, we publish a lot of stuff interesting. We we have quite an interesting take on our social media and we're, you know, we're getting better at it. A lot of stuff on LinkedIn. Uh, if you go and find our site there, we tend to post all of our jobs, announcements, fun pictures, all the guys who sat, well, half of our ASO team was here yesterday watching the Apple announcements. There's a nice photograph of some of the guys there you can have a look at, but say LinkedIn is a good source, uh, our website. Um, we're starting to put more on other channels, but I personally find that most interesting stuff hits LinkedIn. Cool. That's why we also share it in LinkedIn. And now you've got a podcast to share, Mike. So what could be better? Awesome. Thank you so much, Peggy. Thank you. And if you have a story to tell, like Mike, then reach out to me on social or email me, Peggy, Peggy at mobilegroove.com. That's where you'll also find my portfolio of essential reads and resources for the global mobile industry. And if you prefer video, hey, we've got you covered there as well because we have this video podcast powered by The Groove over on YouTube. So until next time, remember, every minute is mobile, so make every minute count. Keep well, and we'll see you soon.